It's qualifying in Bahrain 2018. Sebastian Vettel pulls his Ferrari onto the grid after securing pole position. He's all smiles, his car perfectly positioned for victory. But as the cameras zoom in for the celebration, they see something unusual on the Ferrari steering wheel. There, mounted on the right side of Vettel's steering wheel, sits a third paddle. Not just the standard clutch and gear change paddles that every driver uses, but something else. Soon the entire Formula 1 world is debating this simple paddle. Technical forums are filled with theories, and rival teams study every frame of footage. The most popular theory is that it's a handbrake, giving Vettel an unfair advantage at race starts by letting him hold the car stationary with one finger while he also manages to throttle and clutch. But the truth behind Vettel's secret paddle is probably far more clever than a simple handbrake. Today we're going inside the most complex piece of equipment that any racing driver touches, the Formula 1 steering wheel. And I managed to get access to the Racing Balls factory where their head of electronics walked me through 20 years of steering wheel evolution and showed me the secrets that most people never get to see. We'll uncover how teams have pushed the boundaries of what's legal, what's possible, and what borders on genius. So let's look into Formula One steering wheels, from having zero technology and almost killing champions, to holding software secrets that border on cheating. The first steering wheel technology didn't start with a want for more control. It actually started from tragedy. At the 1966 Belgian Grand Prix, Jackie Stewart is racing his BRM around the old Spa-Francorchamps circuit, just as heavy rain hits. Stewart later described the track surface as polished glass. At 170 miles per hour, Stewart's car aquaplanes off the circuit, slides through a fence, hits a telegraph pole and then a cottage before coming to rest in a ditch. The BRM is crumpled, but that's not the worst part. The fuel tank has ruptured, filling the cockpit with petrol. Stewart is conscious, but trapped and in danger. In an era where fire was motorsport's most feared killer, this was a death sentence waiting to happen. And there's a problem. The steering wheel won't come off. It's bolted directly to the steering column. And without the proper tools, Stuart can't escape his own car. After 25 agonizing minutes, fellow drivers Graham Hill and Bob Bondurant work to free him. There are no marshals and no rescue crews at this part of the circuit just two drivers who happen to crash nearby and a growing pool of fuel. Eventually, they find a spectator with tools and unbolt the steering wheel to pull Stewart free from the car. From that day forward, Jackie Stewart carried a spanner taped to the inside of his cockpit for every single race. And this incident started a push for safety in Formula One. Stewart became motorsport's most vocal safety campaigner, pushing for everything from proper medical crews to required seatbelts. And in time, and with a few more steering wheel related crashes, one of the changes that followed across Formula 1 was the adoption of quick release steering wheels. The quick release steering wheel was among the first real technologies added to the steering wheel itself, and it didn't stop there. So to understand how we got to the incredible tech we see today, I traveled to the Racing Balls headquarters in Faenza, Italy, where Alessandro Poggi, head of electronics, walked me through two decades of steering wheel development. And the tech in these wheels is incredible. But first, I need to tell you about some other incredible tech. Of all the tech that I've tried to improve my daily life, nothing has had more impact than 8 Sleeps Pod 5. It's a mattress cover that turns your regular bed into what's basically a temperature controlled cockpit. And each side runs at different temperatures. So while my wife sleeps at 72 degrees, I'm at 66, which is apparently optimal for deep sleep. And it genuinely makes a huge difference. And it also tracks everything from heart rate, breathing patterns, sleep stages with no wearables needed. It even detects snoring and can certainly adjust to reduce it. They've also got a new blanket that extends the same temperature control to cover your entire body. Head to 8sleep.com forward slash driver61 and use code driver61 for $350 off the Pod 5 Ultra. Now, back to these steering wheels. In front of us sit three wheels that tell the entire story of modern Formula One. The first from 2007. It looks almost primitive by today's standards. Its display has fairly basic information and the bottom layout seems almost empty. You can see it is a, a bit old design and also the display is the, the main difference you can, you can spot. It was a kind of seven segment based display. Now we have a TFT matrix so it's more uh, 
more recent. The 2017 wheel is the middle ground, already featuring the standard electronics that made a big change to Formula One. But it's the modern wheel that shows how far we've come. Over 25 buttons, multiple rotary encoders, a full color TFT display that could show everything from tire temperatures to battery deployment levels. And you might not know this, but back in 2008, the FAA introduced standard electronics. But this standardization didn't dumb down the technology. Instead, the FAA took the best innovations from every team and integrated them into a shared platform. And now every car on the grid runs identical hardware. Standard issue means standard steering wheel electronics. So every car on the grid will have the same PCB, the same electronics inside of here, and the same display. So it means the same number of digital inputs. And this standardization has had a surprising effect, a level playing field that actually accelerated the innovation. Teams couldn't gain advantage through different hardware anymore, so they had to get creative with software and configuration. And there is a lot of room for configuration. So this rotor in position one is a uh, ice combustion, whatever. And then with buttons, I can select what map for that rotary position. Okay. So if the rotary has uh, 14 positions, yeah. and in the software, in each position, I can select 14 maps, is 14 by 14. Okay. If you do the maths across multiple rotaries and button combinations, you're looking at more than a billion possible settings. Now, obviously, they're not all used, but these wheels are still very complicated to manage. That's why the driver needs uh, help, because... <laughs> To remember and the everything. Are, right? His no, exactly. They, they have uh, tables uh, and they have the help from many specialists. Yeah. So there, there will be a tire engineer, a control engineer, a performance engineer, a PU engineer, air engineer. There are many people talking to him, suggesting uh, changes. So it's, it's a big job, yeah. The physical construction of the wheel is also very clever. If you pick up a modern F1 steering wheel, you immediately notice its weight, or rather, the lack of it. The entire structure is made from a single piece of carbon fiber, creating a hollow shell that houses all of the electronics. So if uh, we were able to open it, there is a, a panel in front that is uh, carrying uh, all the buttons, the rotaries, and in the back, the electronics. Okay. So you will see a, like, like a pocket in the carbon, uh, where all the electronics uh, is, uh, is sitting. Uh, this carbon part is a, is, a single, uh, is a single piece. Behind that front panel lies a maze of wires, circuit boards and sensors. It's full of electronics, which can then cause a number of problems. During uh, a wet race, it is very easy for water to find uh, its way through the buttons, the LEDs, uh, the rotaries and this makes stopping the steering wheel to work. So the sealing of the front panel and all of all the components is, uh, is uh, very important. And with all the possible changes, getting the right information to the driver at the right time is a challenge. So when you talk to the race engineer, you have to tell him which is the priority. If it is a reliability, is high priority. If it is a suggestion for performance, you can wait uh, half uh, a a lap uh, if there is something else uh, going on. And it's not just the visual information. So another way we use to help the driver are the tone beeps in the, in the, in the speakers. So combined with, uh, with the LEDs and the display, you can inform the driver of something that is going on. For example, it is time to, to, to shift gear. There is a specific uh, beep. Uh, or pit limiter. You are too quick, you are too slow, there are different beeps. Now, back to Vettel's paddle. The initial theory is focused on a simple handbrake for the race starts. But when the technical analysts started examining the footage more closely, they noticed a detail that pointed to something else. Unlike a typical DRS button or a shifter paddle, which are simple on and off controls, Vettel's paddle was connected to a rotary sensor. And that's a big difference. A rotary sensor gives you control across a range, not just on or off. So instead of a binary switch, this was something that could be adjusted precisely. So what was Vettel actually controlling? Well, most likely it was the car's braking or differential systems. Both areas where variable control could give you an edge. Beyond the handbrake for the race starts theory was a brake bias adjuster that could be used at the start and middle of a tight corner. The idea being that it could help the car turn a bit better 
actually a bit like doing a handbrake turn. A variable pedal here would be helpful to Vettel to shift the balance of the car. Although to be honest, it does sound like it would be very difficult to control. The other idea was around the differential, which the driver usually uses a rotary switch on the steering wheel to control. But a variable pedal would allow you to make tiny adjustments mid corner while you're steering and help try to fix any understeer or oversteer in real time. There was actually a video which we can't show here that shows Vettel appearing to use the paddle throughout laps and corners, not only at the race starts. But maybe the strongest clue comes from his teammate. Kimi Raikkonen, driving the same Ferrari, reportedly never wanted the device in his car, which points to it being more of a driving style specific tool rather than a general performance improvement. Now, Ferrari stayed quiet about the paddle's actual function. Why would their clever engineers give away a potential advantage, which only made people more curious? Unfortunately, we may never know what that simple paddle actually did, but whatever happened, the FIA deemed it to be legal. However, not every team has stayed on the right side of the rules. Our next story goes darker, where innovation crossed the line into probably outright cheating. 1994 was the season that changed Formula One forever. The sport had just banned electronic aids like traction control and active suspension, forcing teams back to a more manual approach. But the regulation changes created another grey area that one team exploited. And the story begins at the Pacific Grand Prix, where Ayrton Senna's race ended on lap one after a collision. As Senna stood trackside, he listened to the car still racing, and he heard something that made him very suspicious. From the Benetton cars, there was a subtle but noticeable sound, a soft misfire on corner exit, and Senna knew what that meant. It was the signature of traction control, a system that was now apparently banned. But what Benetton had done here was actually really clever. Instead of using wheel speed sensors, which were now banned, to detect wheel spin, which is how traction control normally works, they'd found a completely different approach. As a car accelerates, more air gets forced into the engine intake through what's called the ram air effect. The faster you go, the higher the pressure in the intake. By watching these pressure changes, Benetton's engine management system could estimate the car speed and figure out which gear it was in. Now the system knew the speed, the gear and the RPM, so it could do something clever. Throughout testing, the team were calculating how much grip the car had in each corner and when the wheel spin would begin. Once they knew this, they could program the engine to only release the power they knew the car had grip for, which wasn't technically traction control, but it basically did the same job. But the real scandal came after the tragic events at Imola. Following Senna's fatal accident, the FAA demanded source code from the top three teams. When Benetton finally handed over their software, after initially refusing and getting fined, investigators found something hidden. Buried in the code was option 13, a complete launch control system that could automate the entire race start. Everything was managed by the computer, while the driver just kept his foot buried and held on. And if it was used in a race, it was illegal. The legal battle that followed highlighted a major flaw in the 1994 regulations. The FAA could prove the software existed, but they couldn't prove it had been used during a race. The rules banned using these systems, but not just having them in your code. Benetton argued that option 13 was only used for testing and required special activation that wasn't used on race weekends. And the FAA's final statement was telling. The best evidence is that Benetton Formula One Limited was not using launch control at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. Not a definite no, just that they couldn't prove it. The team got fines for not cooperating with the investigation, but escaped technical penalties. Michael Schumacher, as we know, went on to win his first championship that year, though the controversy hung over the whole thing. This episode taught the FAA a valuable lesson about software regulation. You can't police what you can't see. And if the teams are going to hide systems in code, the regulations need to be bulletproof. But while Benetton's innovation was hidden in the software, our final story takes the opposite approach. A system so bold and visible that it almost dared the regulators to stop it. 2020 pre-season testing at Barcelona. Formula One journalists and team personnel are getting their first looks at the new cars when something catches everyone's attention. Lewis Hamilton is driving his Mercedes down the main straight when he does something that nobody has ever seen before. He pulls his steering wheel towards his chest. Then, before the corner, he pushes it back again. 
And as he does this, you can clearly see the front wheels changing angle. The paddock erupts. Within minutes, photographers are zooming in on the Mercedes, trying to capture what they're seeing. And again, social media explodes with theories and the other teams immediately start calling their factories. Mercedes had just revealed their dual axis steering system, DAS. And unlike Benetton's hidden software or Ferrari's secret paddle, this steering innovation was impossible to hide. When the Mercedes driver pulled the steering towards him, it adjusted the toe angle of the front wheels. Toe angle is basically how much the wheels point inward or outward when you look at the car from above. Move the wheel one way and the wheels point slightly outward, what's called toe out. Move it the other way and they return to a neutral position. So why does this matter? On the long straights, the driver could pull the wheel to be set at zero toe which stops the tyre scrubbing across the asphalt and so reduces rolling resistance and increases top speed. In the corners, he'd push the wheel forward for toe out, which gives better turning. And it also helps the tyre temperature. It was tyre management and rolling resistance efficiency all rolled into one driver controlled system. Red Bull immediately lodged a protest, arguing that DAS violated two key regulations. First, the rules against movable aerodynamic devices and second, the ban on adjusting suspension while the car is moving. But Mercedes had done their homework. The FAA's verdict was swift and clear. DAS was a legitimate part of the steering system, not a banned aerodynamic device or suspension adjustment. The ruling made one thing clear. Mercedes hadn't bent the rules. They'd created something that was completely legal under a literal reading of the regulations, even though it clearly wasn't what the FIA had intended. DAS was the perfect example of the modern approach to pushing the boundaries in Formula 1. And it shows how the steering wheel has become more than just a way to control the car. It's the centre of where the driver meets the technology. The Formula 1 steering wheel is an amazing thing, a carbon fibre interface between the human and the machine. And it's the result of thousands of engineers pushing against the boundaries of physics, regulations and their imagination. And it's that relentless pushing of engineering which is one of the reasons why we love Formula 1. So thanks to Alessandro and everyone at Racing Balls for the incredible access. If you enjoyed this video, check out our deep dive into how F1 brakes are made. And please make sure you take a moment to subscribe. It helps us to get even more access just like this. Thank you and I'll see you next time.